Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this apologetics class and we devote it to you, Lord Jesus. You have said that we should always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in us. And Lord, we pray that you now would equip us to do that. It says, first of all, though, that to sanctify Christ as Lord of our hearts. And so we do that, Lord. We confess you are God and we pray now that you would just come and equip us and strengthen us and encourage us in the work of apologetics. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And what a pleasant sight, uh, the parking lot tonight. <laughs> <laughs> where's, where's that at? Okay. okay. Hey, everybody come on in. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you a quick background uh, on me. Um, I was in uh, I was in school years ago. Um, uh, unlike John Laskin, who got apologetics at the first class, um, I didn't get in until later, uh, a couple years later. I don't know, Jeff, if you got a couple years ago, but we didn't go into that. We kind of went through the kind of the, the foundational truth parts first, and um, but apologetics was a very very uh, very important in, in my life um, because it kind of opened the door to logic and reasoning which if we look at salvation um, we accepted Jesus Christ through our mind and it comes to our heart and that's how that change happens so God uses our mind to go ahead and really expand what his truths are and it's very very important and, and my assumption here today is that everyone here knows the Lord uh, and Jesus Christ is their personal savior they don't this is a good class for you to be in. <laughs> but, if, but if you do, the, the process of that happening there where you're hearing the Word and you're hearing the Holy Spirit come into your life and you are regenerated through that, comes through your mind, into your heart. So there's a logical piece to this that needs to come together. And for some reason, we have kind of moved away from all that. And we need to begin to embrace it because the enemy is... Uh, really trying to take over, take over the church, and it has happened. It really has taken over the church. So I want to read really, well, well let me say it this way. We can't really go into apologetics until, unless we know what faith is. Does that make sense? So we need to understand and really drill down what faith is all about and, and what we're defending in terms of that. Mm -hmm. And then we can go into all the different types of, you know, theories and theology and logic and doctrines that would happen there. This really is the starting point where what is faith, what does faith mean? Because so many people think they have faith. All right. So, um, so we're, we're trying to present a, a rational case of, for belief. So apologetics, <coughs> this is what they say, okay, it means to give a logical defense of the Christian faith. Apologetics is a branch of Christianity that defends the authority of God's word, the character of God, Christianity as a whole, and also uses the Bible as an offensive weapon. That's big, 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 big key here. All right. Against all other worldviews and opposition, preparing the believer to become a warrior for Christ. And that's our mandate. That's, you cannot escape that. Go ahead. I would just say, uh, ironically, it's something we don't have to apologize for. <laughs> right. Uh, right. <laughs> so, have you uh, used more of the handouts for the guys that just came in? I don't have any more because I didn't know how many, but um, but I will make sure that I send an email with an attachment because it's actually, there's a 20 page booklet that I have together that I'll be sending to everybody on this. Um, so, before we begin, we have to have some sort of. Uh, do we agree or don't agree on certain principles, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go through certain things, and it's open to the floor to push back and say, hey, yes, no, maybe, okay? Um, first of all, we have a big problem. 69% of the people in the U.S. believe they are Christians. 69%. <clears throat> that was taken in November 2021, Gallup poll. So... Our class is, it's about love. Learning is about love. Okay? We do not win here. God always wins. But we share, and we share knowledge, and that's, that's the church. That's the community there. But we are at war. Make no mistake, we are at war. Mm -hmm. The time of sitting and being pew potatoes is over. 
we are at war. We are demanded to stand up now for faith. Okay? There are only two groups of people in the world. So any argument you ever have in life with anybody about God, about creation or anything else, comes from two sources. Those in Christ, those not in Christ. That's it. All right? And it's a very freeing thing to believe it that way. Because what Satan does is they try to, he tries to drill it down in so many different ways that that confusion is something that marks a sense of longing that's not there. God is not one of confusion. He's very direct. So there's only two types of people in the world. Okay? Um, we are commanded to be Jesus' light. People are either see you in Christ or they don't. And Paul is very specific about this, you know, and so is James, that you can claim to be in Christ, but the fruits of your spirit is what shows that to others and to yourself. But it shows over time. And that's the whole idea of sanctification after regeneration. All right? So what does that mean for us? Being in Christ means about suffering. Okay? And make no mistake, if you're going to be in Christ and you're going to be a warrior for Christ, you will suffer. You will not get away with it. I'm an example of that. I have story upon stories of things that happened when I dedicated myself to the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And I was warned by a, <laughs> a guy who was in his 80s and he says, oh, welcome to the kingdom. You will begin to suffer. And it's so true. Now, it's not a bad thing. I'd rather suffer for Christ than suffer away from Christ. So... Um, and why is that? Because this is not our world. We agree on that, right? This is not our world. Our world is beyond. We are here to, to do his work, but our world is beyond. So, here's where the controversial stuff is. Faith is not religion. Is that understandable? Faith is not religion. All right. So you have two choices then. A person's either leaning towards God or leaning away. There's never a neutral position. Okay? There's, there's nothing neutral about it. So, so when, you're, when you're talking to somebody and you're trying to understand their life story and what, <clears throat> what's going on there, in terms of discernment, in terms of understanding, you can get a very good grasp if someone's leaning towards the Lord or not. Or away. You know, and, and you know, Jeff made a great analogy, and, I, and I've often spoke about that, about sanctification. People have this idea that if you're being sanctified, you're supposed to be going like this, but it's not like this. So it's like this and like that, <laughs> like that, and you're kind of going up and down like that. And that's the, usually the pathway, and that's part of the growth process of testing, suffering, and what have you. Um, people in Christ live in a flat plane. And it's a very important concept to know. We are very blessed to have Jeff and John and the elders here to do their work that God has given them to do. We also have work here to do. Um, <clears throat> Jesus' organization is very, very flat. You know, people have a tendency in their mind to idolize leaders. You know, instead of idolizing the Creator. Amen. And so, we have to be very, very mindful that that. We're all human beings. By God's grace, we've been given a plan through his spiritual gifts to do what we're going to do. You know, um, when I was in school, I can't tell you how many times people came to me, well, you came here to be a preacher. Mm, that wasn't my calling to be a preacher. I like to talk about things, teach people. Mm -hmm. Jeff's calling was to be a preacher. Mm -hmm. Mine was to teach, to learn, and to, and to be among the people to really kind of get to know them. And the same thing happens with all of you there. That's why apologetics is so important in your life in terms of how you go ahead and fill those gaps that people have there with God's truth. Okay? Um, and judge appropriately. Separate the essentials from the non-essentials. That's a, a trap that Satan uses all the time, is that when it comes to understanding what is happening in the world, that he pinpoints different shortcomings in people's lives. And he makes them as if 
that is the reason why, well, he's a great accuser, that is the reason why you're never going to be that much closer to the Lord. You know? And it could be completely non-essential. And Paul talks about it um, <coughs> when he says that you know, some people you will have to uh, respect where their belief is, and you may have to do a few changes in your life to go ahead and honor them. And the same goes true for yourself, too. But it's very, very important to really understand what the essential components are about God's grace, His salvation, what His mandates are for the world, what the gospel of the Great Commission is, compared to everything else. You know? And unfortunately, and Jack, you're going to go through this, seminary can really mess that up. You know, they can do, they can do a, a number on that because they, they kind of put everything as, everything's important. And, and you kind of, you have to sift through that. You've got to sift through that. So, um, so what is faith? What is faith? So the question I have for everybody here, and I, I really want to hear responses, can you have faith and not have an enemy? Depends on what your faith is in. What do you mean? Well, if your faith is in Christ, you'll have a boatload of enemies. But if your faith is in Allah, you'll have some, but maybe not as many. Depends on where you're at and who you believe in. Mm -hmm. Depends on your geography, what country you're in. So you're recognizing that we have an enemy? Yeah. Oh, well, we do have an enemy. Okay. Do you, so the question then for the group is, is that... Um, can anybody accept Jesus Christ as a personal savior just on faith alone, without understanding what the enemy is? Okay, can you do that in a vacuum? No, I don't it's think an so. important. It's an important question. I don't think so because we don't live in a vacuum. Hmm. We have to do it where we live, right? Okay. Anybody else? I mean, I don't know. I'm just hey, saying. Go deeper in that question, because can I pose it again? <clears throat> well, you can't have just have faith in faith. You you need to have it, like you said before, an intellectual understanding in your mind mm -hmm. of what and who you are believing in, mm -hmm. right. and um, the reason we're believing. Right. And that's what you're getting to is because you know it's like okay, I have faith. But what does that What does that mean? What does salvation mean? Like, mm -hmm. what am I being saved from? Right. You know, uh, to know that God, there is a God. <clears throat> Okay, right, and we all know the verse that says, even the demons believe that, right. but they fem they fear and tremble. So, what exactly is you know our heart putting our trust in? And we have to have the intellectual you know understanding of what we are mm -hmm. you know committing ourselves to. We have to know the God of the Bible. It would seem that if you just have faith, the first time the enemy attacks, your faith may crumble. I mean, you don't have the awareness that it's not all you need. Right. Some, sometimes um, I feel like I am the enemy. I, I am my own worst enemy, and you know, I, I you know, I pray that you know, he'll fill me with with ever the beliefs and everything that I have, but he'll you know keep me from my unbelief. You know what I mean? Well, to, to that point, I'm glad you brought that up. It was something I was going to bring up later. But there's three spheres of sin mm -hmm. around us. Okay, that's um, there's the demonic realm mm -hmm. that comes down. There's the world, the world the flesh and the right? And then there's our innate sin nature. Mm -hmm. So there's three spheres that we may tackle one, we may not be able to get the other one yet, or we get this. So we're always being attacked. That's why we have to be very alert and vigilant about what we think and believe. Faith and understand what the enemy is and who the enemy is. Yeah. My suggestion to everybody here is that the biggest enemy right now is the church. It's not even the people outside. It's not even government. It's the church. The church is imploding inside out. And, I, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, about why that's happening. And, and it has to be for us to go ahead and change that. And Cornerstone is becoming that sort of Epicenter, Boys, yeah, that yeah. little that center now where that is people are are waking up to that. Mm -hmm. That we're seeing that the church is imploding and we need soldiers out there to help. We need a generation that's gonna change all that. You know, because we sit in sidelines way too long. Right. So we so number one is, is that having faith is also knowing the enemy. Mm -hmm. Or else why would you have faith if you don't know the enemy? Okay. 
And it's a very, very important concept to put in your mind there in terms of getting to the next level of what apologetics is all about. Okay. If I could jump, jump on yeah, that sure. for a second. So I think one of the, um, I'm a big fan of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the screw tape letters. And uh, if you listen to um, what screw tape said to you know, his protege, um, you know, he, he told, you know, told him to make the Christian comfortable, make him, um, you know, yeah, warmly, uh, <laughs> make the Christian comfortable, make him, um, you know, uh, feel good and, and, you know, that he's going to church on Sunday, and, mm -hmm. you know, as long as he's not evangelizing, as long as he's not, and I think that um, that gets to, to the point of, in America, right, one of the reasons why the church is imploding is because we're so comfortable. It, and so I think in recent days there have been, um, circumstances that have forced folks, you know, Christians, to confront whether they actually believe what they've been saying they believed all along, um, and you're seeing sort of a self-sorting of, of people going uh, to these oases of, of places like Cornerstone or The Rock or, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Grace, and, and like the, the, different, um, the different churches that are standing firm on, um, you know, the Bible and, and God's Word, and those who are bending their doctrines and bending their uh, their faith around the culture. And so um, I think that um, the, the idea of, of knowing an enemy and how that enemy <coughs> operates, I think, is important. It's super important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things we were talking about, I just went over the agreement that, that I had there. We're trying to build a rational case and get into the idea of, of do we have an enemy. Um, and we're going to talk about the pagan construct, which is, uh, but before we do that, I just want to read something, um, and I, I like to get some feedback for it. It says, like, why did we do all this? So the point of all theological study or apologetics and or reading scriptures is not principally arrive at sound doctrine. That should be found out as we grow with our walk with Christ, but our studies most importantly are to know and worship Jesus in spirit and in truth. Amen. Not worship the doctrines themselves. <coughs> Sound doctrine will always point to the living Lord with his truth, but never back at itself. Remember that. Okay? Secondly, it would be foolish for us to expect that this work that we're doing together will meet with general approval. It's not going to. All right? The trend of modern theology, if theology can be called, all right, is ever towards the deification of of the creature rather than the glorification of the creator. Mm. That is a key component to what's going on right now. Mm. You have to embrace that. That the paganism that's come into the church is about people being their own God. Mm. Yeah. We'll talk about that. Okay? Um, the leaven of present day rationalism is rapidly permeating the whole of Christianity. And that's the truth. Hence, the social theological pendulum that we go through Okay, swings towards either side of extremes, from one end being antinomianism, or towards the other side, which is legalism. So you're constantly going back and forth like this. And depending on which group you're going to be at, you're going to see that. But the idea for here with apologetics is a sermon to cut through all that and understand what God's truth is because he breaks through all that. And it's extremely important <coughs> that you understand that. So with this study, we, we want to rationally understand the nuance of what, why, how we believe our beliefs, or in short, have faith. It was once told to me, and this is a mentor of mine who told me this, that we always lean on our faith in Christ alone. If we always lean on our faith on Christ alone, we will falter. He had warned me. That was that 80-year-old John I was talking about. Why? Because we are humans saved by His grace, and there is nothing we can do to produce more faith but certainly can produce less. And that's the truth. You'll find through sanctification that, and, and Dave just brought it up a little while ago, that sometimes he feels that he doubts everything, and he's pulling away from that. That's why knowing truth you know, is, is absolutely key in terms of continuing to grow in Christ. Okay? <laughs> um, that's just a stage that our faith must have proof points to validate why we believe what we believe. Or else, everything becomes about feelings more than faith. And, and that's key. And you go into a person, you ask them, what do you believe in? Well, I believe in God. 
oh, you're, you're a Christian, right? Yeah. And, and I feel it. That should raise a red flag right away. That's something that you say in the back of your mind, okay, what's going on here? Yes, well, of course we absolutely feel his glory at times and all that stuff. But if we always pursue our faith on, based on feelings, we will fail every time. And I can't tell you my life that has happened to me personally. All right? So it's surprising for me that in this day and age, so many claim to have faith but do not know the gospel or scripture. All right? And the results of this are when turmoil occurs, which is what Bob is talking about, Many walk away from the faith they claim to have known, yet others twist it to fit their own narrative and paradigm, which we'll talk about, and even others will exploit the word faith for their own devices. And Paul talks about that, about the wolves slowly <coughs> coming in. Christ warned us of all these things with the parable of the seas landing in various barren <coughs> ground within Matthew. So, what is faith to be replaced by is what I'm going to talk about is tribal spiritualism. Mm. All right, tribal spiritualism. And uh, it's no different than New Age, pagan religion, monotheism, or deism, whereby your belief in culture constructs, overshadow God's truth through his word. It looks like a church, but it's not God's church of his truth. Additionally, we made the most important decision in our life in accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Should we not defend our faith as his elect? And that's a, that's a question that you have to take personally and really think about it. I mean, you made the most important decision in your life. You know, it's, it's, it's the, above everything else, you know. Shouldn't you defend it? Should we have not a rational response for who do not believe or challenge even those who claim to believe but do not show any fruit of their confession of faith? This isn't a nice to have, it's a must have. Last but not least, the belief in the 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice, does not apply in defending the faith. It's at this juncture that many think believers in Christ are all over. And they have every reason to believe this because we do. Our goal so, is to be... I, I was, if I could, so Ivan and I, um, I'm cheating because we, <laughs> we talked about this uh, the other night. Um, but it is funny because I've heard that uh, before the 11th commandment, thou shalt be nice. And the response I gave Ivan was, what is more kind or nice than telling someone the truth? Right? And uh, you know, the, anal the analogy that's been used over, or metaphor that's been used over and over again, you know, um, throwing a, you know, a life preserver to a drowning man, right? Isn't telling them the truth doing that? Especially the, the, the truth about the gospel, right? Isn't that essentially trying to save someone's life? And what is more kind or nice than that? <coughs> So, uh, the key takeaway is uh, we don't believe in the easy salvation. Accepting gospel, accepting the whole gospel, not pardon. Um, self examination, repentance is a starting point. God's intervention is on His terms, not ours. In, in, in short, as Paul says, we are a slave to Christ. When we accepted Him and He bought us with a price, we are His slave. We are to Him. And today's preachers, and I have, when I sent out the, the, uh, these notes, there's a list of preachers there that really don't preach that. You have to be mindful of that. So, any questions about what I just read? Does, any, does that make sense to you? Yeah? I, I assume since people are actually here for the apologetics that everyone agrees that we're called to defend, um, you know, to make a defense for our faith, mm -hmm. right? <coughs> anyone, anyone think that's... Not something we have to do. <laughs> yeah. Ivan, just one thing. We're defending the biblical faith, because I see the Pope trying to form an ecumenical interfaith movement of Buddhists, Hindus, you know, Muslims and Christians. Right. You know. So we've got to be sure of our definition of what our well, faith is. Which brings it brings into this <laughs> so, so I always mess with soteriology. soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. Right. But this is the pagan construct that's all over the U.S. I would say probably more than 90% of the churches are in this. Okay? And it, there's a connection to what's going on here. I don't know if you ever heard of this term called tribal spiritualism. It's something that, that was kind of coined when I was in school. 
and I pushed it along and I got a lot of pushback from when I was in school uh, because it was shaking things up. But tribal spiritualism is basically taking the church and making it honed in to where, whatever the cultural issue is. So it could be the church of pro-choice, the church of transgender, the church of Black Lives Matters, church of whatever, prosperity gospel. It becomes the church of that. Right. And so this, this, this is really the beginning of paganism and what happens there. And um, can someone to look up uh, ethical nihilism? Nihilism. Nihilism. Yeah. If someone can look that up and just read it to me. Because this kind of gives you what, how the energy of that is being driven. Um, there's moral nihilism. Is that the same thing? Yes, yeah, so you can use that too. Uh, let's see. Ethical nihilism or moral nihilism rejects the possibility of absolute moral or ethical values. Mm -hmm. Instead, good and evil are nebulous, mm -hmm. and values addressing such are the product of nothing more than social and emotive pressures. Right. You go from the absolute to the relative. My truth. Do you My notice that in the church now? My truth. Mm -hmm. My truth. Mm -hmm. Right. So the mission of this is to make the church a blank. <coughs> This is, we don't really believe anything because it's no absolute truth. Mm -hmm. So the moral relativism is the motivation behind it. And then there's this phenomenon that's happening right now, we're living it, it's called religious speciesism. Okay? So, so religious speciesism makes two results, less thans and nuns. Not N-U-N, that's So who are, who are the less thans? Who's the less than? Anyone who doesn't. Know? What? Anyone who doesn't prescribe to that. And who would that be? Mm -hmm. Anyone outside of that? Christian. I think all we're all less than, right here. All right. This is where this is where we're landing. There. Okay. The nuns are the group that falls out of there. They're not affiliated with anything. They're so neutral that they have they have no affiliation um, with religiously it. or uh, doctrinally. They they just don't. Don't really care about that. But where the lesson? The church here, this type of church, thinks that we're off base. That our truth, and it's really not our truth, God's truth, is something that's outside their sphere. So <coughs> we have churches all around here in Mount Laurel that are this. And I'll submit to you this. That is paganism. Make no mistake, that is paganism. That's what happens. And this church, the little light that it is right now in the rock, the little light it is, is one of the beacons there against all this paganism activity that's happening there. So the question I have for everybody here, and it's a tough question, do you think there's believers in these churches? <coughs> I think there's people that think they're believers. Hmm? They have head belief, not heart belief. Mm -hmm. They haven't. Take it to the next level. Do you think... Do you think if they're going into a community of a church that's practicing paganism, so right? Let's, let's let's parse though. There may be believers that mm -hmm. aren't buying into what the the teaching is there, mm -hmm. but are there for other reasons, like right. family ties or, or what have you, that they haven't actually left the church, but they're not buying it. But then there are those that are sitting in the pews, soaking it up, right, and are completely bought in uh, to that. So. I think we should probably differentiate between the people that are um, that are uh, that don't buy in mm -hmm. to the you know whether it's you know the ethical nihilism or or the church of mm -hmm. um, that just haven't <coughs> left yet. Yeah. <laughs> Chad, could you read Romans one eighteen to twenty three? God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. 
For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were, dark, were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. I would say that's a lie in the sand. I would, I would say that that's a lie in the sand that, that God has said to us. And either on one side of it or on the other side of it. And, and when we don't want to parse words that there are nice people in there, make no mistake, this is, this is how paganism starts and this is how it's become entrenched in there. Um, Christ Church is, uh, if you, can someone read Acts 2, 37 to 43? And this is Christ Church. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 2, 143? 2, yeah. Uh, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added about 3,000 souls that day. Mm. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayers. <coughs> and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Mm -hmm. okay. So this, that's Christ church. And then we see what we have in terms of what the church is now, what's going on there. So two completely ways of the way church is being done. And we need to understand that, so the nuance of it. So when we, when we start to study in depth in terms of our faith with apologetics, we need to understand what the differences are between the two. Can someone read 1 John um, 5, 4 to 5? I call that the welcome. Okay. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And that's her faith. So, at this point, <clears throat> you're all semi-seminary students, okay? <laughs> all right. So, and now you're going to get your big class. This is the big class now, okay? There was a school that opened up, and it was only open for a little while. And half the class failed, and the other half passed, okay? Yet the mark that this school did has lasted for generations, okay? So can someone read for me uh, Luke 23, 40 to 43? Okay. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do not do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. Mm -hmm. And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. <coughs> Could you read it again a little slower, verse by verse? But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me. Thank you for that. All right. So, I had to go to seminary for all that time, and so did Jeff, and so did a few others. To learn all these different things. That is the gospel. 
That is the beginning point. That is everything. You don't have to be a scholar to understand what has happened. All right. So why did the thief know that many, or what, that, that many <coughs> do not know? Recognition to fear God. That was number one. It was a recognition to fear God. Um, a recognition of his own sin. Okay. A recognition that he deserved to die. Hmm. A recognition of a sinless man before him. A recognition of the Christ himself. A recognition that without Christ he cannot enter paradise. A recognition of Christ's forgiveness and mercy. That, that's the story. Congratulations. You all graduated <laughs> seminary. I'd say, too, I, uh, he recognized that, that the death of Christ on the cross was not going to be the end. No. Of, exactly. Of the True. Lord. Absolutely. Absolutely true. His kingdom was still coming. Right. <clears throat> so, that's all said and done. The question I always have about this, and, and it always gives me chills when I read this, is what was the other guy thinking? What was happening there? And we're going to talk about election of free will. And how does that work? We're not going to talk about it today, but how does that work? You have thousands of people looking at the cross. If you can imagine, thousands are looking. You have the Christ there. You have a man there that's dying. You have another man that's dying. One says no. One says yes. Why did the one say no? Why? He's going to die. Why? That always bothered me. One of the first things he... To ask Jesus is to get us down. You're the big. So he was only concerned about the things of this world, not the next. Right. Which was so. What ends up happening um, <coughs> when we think about what happened in the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. and Eve took the fruit, mm -hmm. and with the promise that she would be like <coughs> God. That's at the stage for what's going to happen for the, the remainder until the Lord comes back. So, not only is there two types of people that are in Christ or, or not in Christ, but there's two types of people that one believes in the sovereignty of God, mm -hmm. one believes they are God. Mm -hmm. And everything comes from that. <clears throat> so, when you look at that central argument, that's the beginning of apologetics. Understanding the central thesis of what that is. Either man wants to be God, or he recognizes God. That's it. Everything else comes from that. You, know, you, you can't escape the fact. So government, religion, finances, science, the motivations behind that is either they're going to give the glory to God or they, they want to be God. And we've seen it time and time again through Scripture with, uh, with Egypt, with Rome, with the Pharisees. Um, so it's not a concept that's very alien to us. But when we think about it, and, and this is where I'm pushing this home, when we think about it, we want to be able to contextually cut that down so we, instead of getting caught in the mire, take a step back and say, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. you want to be like God. I, I always, when I have um, a, a, a situation where I'm talking to somebody who says, I don't believe in God, well, you believe, you believe in something, you know, you have to believe in something, you have faith in something, right? And they go, what do you mean? I said, well, now you believe in gravity, right? Natural theology. Thomas Aquinas said, um, for something to exist, there has to be an existence. Yeah. Bas basic thoughts. So somebody has faith in something. Either they have faith in God, or they have faith in themselves to be God. And when you're looking at it from a rational point of view and a critical point of view of taking that from the stair, you can tackle a myriad of all types of issues that's going on here. Yeah. And, and be able to defend our faith accordingly through God's truth there. All right? Does is, is anybody have any questions about that? Is that? No, I will say that uh, what Rich said um, about the, the thieves on the cross, um, how one was concerned about this world and the other one was concerned about um, you know, the world beyond, um, I think that's a good reason why a lot of people don't don't want to try, don't want to uh, um, you know, come to faith, faith in Christ because it means that they're going to have to probably give up 
uh, some of the things of this world that they, and had, uh, that they enjoy. And face so. accountability after yeah. that. Yeah. So what would that say for us in terms of going to them and talking to them about this? <coughs> or is that something that can't be changed, Matt? Mm -hmm. Sorry, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> so what, how do we address that as, as believers and talking to people who are going through that? Um, I mean, you, you have to uh, lean on the fact that um, this world is temporary, um, mm -hmm. and that and that you know eternity um, is by definition for forever, and and the the fact that um, you know their their eternal soul is is in peril, and mm -hmm. and then you can launch into the gospel at that point, and um, you know I've heard arguments um, you know a, about Christianity and, and the fact that it. Um, you know, casts us as, you know, uh, despicable creatures, and right. and you have to get into less than. yeah, less than. <laughs> and then you have to get into the fact that you know the eternal God of the universe cared so much about us that He sent His Son to die on the cross for us, and that is an, is a testament to our um, you know value and worth. So, thank you. Um, so, can someone read? Uh, well, actually, some read Genesis uh, 1 through 5, just real quick. Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts in the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the ser servant, serpent, We may eat of the trees of the of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but she said, but God said, you shall not eat of the tree, of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you will die. Thank you, God. <laughs> but the serpent said to the, to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So that's and that's and that's really the stepping stone of everything that's happening. So understand and embrace that. <coughs> so in terms of, oh, I just want to bring this home. I don't think I have anything else for us today. Um, but just understand that if we can take those two concepts, those in Christ, not in Christ, those who want to be God, those who recognize who God is, that's really the cornerstones of why we're looking at things that are happening around the world right now. And, and make no mistake, God is shaking things up now. Um, so much so that people are questioning their own faith because, and they should, because they really didn't have a strong foundation of what's going on. Um, so the purpose of this precursor was really to understand what, what faith means. Um, we have a second part to this, what we'll do next week, which we'll get a little bit deeper. This was kind of like a top level, just telling, telling what, what faith is or isn't or what's going on there. And we'll delve a little bit deeper in that, and then we're going to start to go into the, um, the different types of doctrines and theology. Um, it's a quarter of... Do, yeah, there was a, if I can get on here, if there's a video, I'd love to... It doesn't... Let me see if it's something powered off. The TV powered off, I think. Oh, okay. It's all right, we can turn the TV back on. The remote's right over there, man, by my eyeglass case. Yep. Which one is it? I guess it's this one. This one. Yeah, the one you Yeah. I don't know if I can, if it comes up or not. I see it. It's HDMI 3. Okay. Um, it's telling me I'm not connected to this yet. Connected to the. Uh, what I will do. Something. Is there a hot spot? Yeah. Well, I'm just. I'll just play it off my phone because it's just. It's easy enough to even hear it. Um, I don't necessarily have to see it, but we'll just play it off of here. I think it's a. It's a good way to end. This first round. <coughs> So while he's getting that up, the job search as we know it is dead. And if you're still out there cold submitting your resume and getting auto rejected 80 to 90 percent of the time, you're just adding on to the problem. Okay. I want to show you a different way. Even though scripture permits the righteous enjoyment, 
Now, I want to read something. I don't typically do this, but I want to read something right now from the outset to set the framework, the theological framework, for the discussion that A.D. and I have in this episode. I've written this. R.C. Sproul famously preached a sermon called The Tyranny of the Weaker Brother. His premise comes from Romans chapter 14. He talks about how the church should welcome the weaker brother into membership with grace, but he warns of the weaker brother's tendency to be a tyrant towards the rest of the body. The weaker brother, due to his weaker faith and underdeveloped conscience, has a bad habit of adding the traditions of men to the laws of God. Unfortunately, he often does not do this merely for himself, but for others. For example, the weaker brother will frequently insist that their fellow church members, and especially their pastors, not drink alcohol, even though scripture permits the righteous enjoyment of alcohol to the glory of God. And yet, churches should still welcome the weaker brother into their membership and be willing, and in certain contexts, to lay down their liberties in order to avoid becoming a stumbling block for him. But should the church welcome the weaker brother as their pastor? That is the question. If the Apostle Paul labels the one whose conscience is wrongfully bound by man-made traditions as objectively weaker, should this individual be in a position of authority over those who are objectively stronger, according to the Word of God? Clearly, Paul, Paul's point has to do with faith. Therefore, the weaker brother is not merely weaker in some kind of abstract way. Rather, in accordance with Scripture, the weaker brother of Romans chapter 14 possesses less faith than his other brothers and sisters in Christ. Such a man should be graciously welcomed into the church, but is there not a serious problem when the church is led by those with the least amount of faith? In these cases, by virtue of both the individual's person and position, the church becomes a, contact, a context for mass tyranny. Man-made traditions become church-wide requirements that everyone is commanded to follow, despite Christ having purchased freedom from such traditions by the costly price of his own blood. Is there currently a national and even global epidemic of weaker brothers filling our church's pulpits. Wearing a mask is not a law of God, and yet many of our puny faith pastors have wrongfully bound the consciences of all their congregants in this regard. The same can be said of pastors requiring vaccines for worship or segregating the people of God on the Lord's day according to their vaccination status, having a vaccined area and a non-vaccined balcony. Pastors are actually doing this. Possessing a conscience that is so poorly shaped is not a disqualification for salvation, that is membership in Christ church, but it should be a disqualification for pastoral ministry, that is eldership in Christ church. Would not the Apostle Paul expect the office of elder to be filled by stronger brothers. The past couple years have appeared to prove that the vast number of evangelical churches are being led by the weakest among us, according to clear biblical standards. And <clears throat> rampant tyranny has been the result. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you... So, well, that's a little warning. What, what's, what the, who is that? Um, Joel Webbin, right response. Yeah. yeah. Who is it? Yeah, exactly. Oh. Rapid response. Uh, right response. Oh, right response. Right, right, right response, response meeting. I think Ivan's, he'll have the links in there. Yeah, I'll, I'll put the links in there. All right, cool. But yeah. then everything we go over is going to be distributed right. to everyone with references to all the, the videos and books and everything that were used to put the materials together. So. Um, don't don't feel like you have to furiously <coughs> take notes or anything. Jeff, I have a question for you. Um, if we do um, move to a bigger church, will there be a balcony unit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Only for the realtors. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, th uh, do do you have any questions or anything? Again, this is the starting point, so we're there. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I want to address one thing we were talking about. Do we think there's any? 
Christians in those churches. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to say yes for the reason that some of the churches are just, you know where I came from, right? are just starting some of this, and people are starting to wake up. Yeah. I didn't know at the time. I knew something was wrong. Mm -hmm. I felt something wrong. But until I talked to somebody that already found out <laughs> that this church was here, or well, as I knew, was something was wrong, and I didn't. There was confusion. What right. to go, where to go, and what to do. I think there's a lot of people like that. I think there's a lot of people that are good Christians that are confused by it because it's. it's in some churches today, maybe they've been doing it for a year or two years. Right. Some are starting it new, and it's creeping in mm -hmm. in such a way that maybe they're not seeing it right away. <clears throat> so, I do have, think you have to make allowance for those people that are. Yeah, and I, and I think I, I said that early on that there's there's a difference between people that are buying in to the Correct. new messages, Correct. right? Agreeing um, with and then there are people who, for some reasons, you know, want to give the benefit of the doubt or have, you know, family <clears throat> attachments or, you know, other other you know things that are keeping them in a place they ought not be. But in their heart, you know, the, the Lord is is moving them out, and it's just taking them some time to Correct. eventually wake up and move out. But if, if they start, um, if they allow themselves to start soaking in, right, soaking in uh, that new teaching, I'll just call it new teaching, um, you know, then, then they're going to start having problems, right? Great. So that's, that's where it gets tricky. So eventually they're going to, they're gonna, you know, have to see their way out of there. Um, but there are also other people, I think they, you guys talked about this in, in the men's group, that wanted to stay and fight for the church, right, mm -hmm. to to change the thinking of the that, leadership that was there, point right, people who who aren't bought in and they want to save the church, that that specific church. I don't mean the church, um, you know, as a whole, but save that specific church by um, by from within influencing the leadership, um, you know, in a in a in a way that's that's guided more towards you know God's word and away from some of these cultural messages that are that are coming out there. So I think there there's sort of those two camps of of believers in there, and then there's certainly a huge, uh, you know, cadre of people that are totally bought in and are pushing this sort of cultural nonsense mm -hmm. in the church, mm -hmm. and and I don't think those folks are believers at all. You know, I, I just praise God that um, everyone here, I mean, we obviously came from somewhere, so we have that gift that God has given of us of discernment, much like the person on the right of Christ on the cross and on the left. One had the gift of discernment. One did not, mm -hmm. and and I, you know, I praise God for that. Like, we, you know, Bob you, and I, we, we tried to save our old church. Like I know. you were saying, yep. yeah. And we could see it was going, but once you, you once you see, and then they're they're not changing. Mm -hmm. It was time to find a biblically based place to go. Mm -hmm. right. And I, I'm just, you know, I, I praise God that that He gave me that gift of discernment to yeah. know when it was time to go. Yeah. And I think everybody here has come from somewhere. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and thank the Lord for Jeff and for John too. For being here. <laughs> yeah, for being here. <laughs> but I, I, I can't emphasize enough where we fall into a trap where we, we kind of say, yeah, it's a church. It's kind of like a church, you know. And, um, and we have to be very, very clear in terms of optics and vernacular of, of what is Christ's church and what is paganism. There's no, there's no, in, there's no in between. There's no ambiguity <coughs> between that. And, um, and if, if you come with a heart of love to talk to people who are in those type of churches and try to explain to them through God's word and discern that they're practicing, you know, pagan worship, then that opens up a whole new arena of a conversation and dialogue. Um, they may not want to hear it at first, but I think the mistake that we do is, is that um, we, we kind of give them the floor of saying, well, you're, you're still going to church, so you may have some, some osmosis of some biblical truth coming through there. And in, in some cases, it may be true, but, but make no mistake, it's... There's, there's either this way or that way. There's like there's no in between. As as we were reading in Romans, there's a line in the sand, and and it's not as as not a matter of being legalistic about it. You know, it's 
this, this is Christ's church. It's, this is the way it should be, not what's going on right now. Anything else in that outside of that context is, is really labeled yeah, as that, hey. Another way of putting it is anytime anything, any, um, you know, cultural, uh, you know, uh, priority, whether it's the LGBTQ, whether it's your racial reconciliation, whatever it is, anytime that's elevated above what the Word of God says, okay. it's, it's now become uh, paganism, as, as you said, because you're now worshiping something other than in Christ and, and God's yeah. Word. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a story. Word, right? So when I was, was, when I was in school, um, we, we were assigned cohorts, which means you're, you're assigned like a, a temporary kind of mission field and everything. And um, so I was assigned to go to the Bordentown prison to do ministry there, there. And the person that was leading the ministry there was a gay woman from our school. And, and that was my first interaction of like, what, you know, like, and at, <laughs> after I denied to do the cohort, I, my life at that point became very difficult in terms of going to the school because now my eyes opened up like, wait a minute, you can't be that far away to a lot of, plus having a woman who's a pastor, which is not theologically or doctrinally or scripturally correct, but then having that other thing there. So the subtlety of it, the, the school had already accepted it and had already done that and was teaching people to go out to the fields and preach whatever they were going to preach. But I can say the PTS now is, is, is a pagan school. It's not, I had some great, great biblical teachers, my what Old school? Testament teachers. What school was that? Prince of Theology. Yeah. Priest of the Theological, yeah. theological Seminary. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, Jeff had Dallas, and so that's, I mean, that's very grounded, although now they're maybe... A little having, bit of a drift starting. Yeah, yeah. time to drift, like yeah. this. And so for us, it's really, really important to see the seeds of, of these things starting to happen, and, and, and not to kind of play the fluff game of saying, oh, okay, it may go away, whatever. It's not going to go away. Mm. It, it's simply not. You know, and, and it starts very little, but it gains momentum very quickly. And then we can be stuck like that. And for the young men here who is going to have families and everything, this is crucially important for you. You know, because it affects everything. Uh, I can almost compare it like a virus. You know, it affects everything. It affects schools. It affects churches. And now it's affecting the medical community. You know, it's, it affects everything that's happening there. So it's really incumbent on us to go ahead and, and stand strong for the Lord. You know, we're not perfect. By God's grace, thank you, Lord, that, you know, we're, we're able to go ahead and come together in a gathering to talk as men about this. Mm -hmm. But we need to understand who the enemy is. We, un we need to understand what's happening, you know. The, the mindset that the problem is out there and it's people who are not in the churches is the wrong mindset right now. The mindset is it's about the church. We wouldn't be in the problems we are right now in this country if the churches did what they were supposed to be doing. We would not. It, it wouldn't happen. So it really is for us to understand that this implosion that happens there, we need to address it on a, on a granular level as a warrior, one-to-one -one with people in love, in God's love, but say, hey, you got to get the scales out of your eyes. You know, this, is, this is a mess. This is not going to go away. You know? And I... And, 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 and I know Jeff and I have spoken about this, and, and Drew and, and I have spoken about this, that, that there is obviously, sift, God is shaking the tree right now. Mm -hmm. He's really, really shaking it. Part of the sifting process. But yeah, I mean, it is, it is happening, and it, it seems like things are speeding up, mm -hmm. and, and that's, well, you know, scriptural, that's what's going to happen. Everything's going to speed up. <clears throat> but thank the Lord that we have the assurance that no matter what happens, mm -hmm. we're grounded. In, in what he has done in our lives and that no matter what happens we know the future we know what's what's going to go on we know because on scriptural truth on the holy spirit within us on the sermon that is given to us we have that assurance mm -hmm. that that no matter what's going to happen we will meet him in glory and the charge for us is to finish strong and we we want to finish strong that's the key you said it the Holy Spirit within you. Many of these people that are coming out of these liberal churches don't have the Holy Spirit right. in them. 
Yeah. And the ones that do are the ones that have discernment and were discerned enough to get out of the churches, the liberal churches they were in. Right. Uh, well, I people, thank you. People okay. look. People look for churches that fit their lifestyle and their beliefs, as opposed to someone coming out of a church that are that are leaning this way and that way, that that know the truth. They're looking mm -hmm. for a church that are preaching biblical truth. Right. So, what we're doing is is growing that way because that's what we're teaching. We're teaching the the, the Bible and not wavering. Mm -hmm. What they're doing in those other churches. You can't stop what they're doing. I mean, you can't. The people are going to go there for their own reasons, for their own prideful reasons. You know. I think what we're doing here is, is just keeping, keeping focused on what we need to do. Mm -hmm. You know, those well, people are going to figure it out. Yeah, corresponding to what you're saying, that there are those who are in Christ and those out of Christ. Right. Right. So. The sheep, the goats, the right, wheat, right. the tare. Right. It, it's all through Scripture. Corresponding to that, the, the epistemology of the one who's in Christ is God's Word yeah, over against man's word. man's word. And so what I liked about that Joel Webin video that you showed, he's coming out of Romans 14 and letting that be the authority. Mm -hmm. And he's not saying that it's, you know, this person who wears a mask is bad and this, that person who doesn't is good. He's making the point that mask, vaccine, whatever, a shepherd cannot bind the conscience of a freedom issue. So it's a Romans 14 issue. You want to wear a mask? Wear a mask. I don't care. Wear what you want. Right. But if a pastor says, I will assert this authority over your freedom in Christ, right. and you must sit in the balcony if you're not vaccinated right. or something like that, that is clearly <clears throat> overstepping his authority in Christ. He's not obedient to the word of God. He's not submitted to his head. And, um, and now you know that this is a weak brother who ought not be pastoring. Right. So any churches that are doing that, they're wow. separating the church. That's, that's what Webin is, is making the point of. And he's a great teacher. I've watched a lot of them, so um, I'm glad that you, you chose that clip. And if that so, doesn't yeah. throw a red flag up and get you to get up out of the, your right. pew and get out of the If someone church, is telling you you can't walk into to Christ's <laughs> church without right. having right. Uh, gene therapy in right. your arm, then it's, that, that guy should not be leading. Right. right. When they elevate man's word to be tantamount with God's word, Right. Man's word versus God's word. That's mm -hmm. key distinction. Well, thank you, brothers. Um, <coughs> Father, I... Oh, gosh. Hold on. <laughs> um, Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for Ivan, Father. As preparation, his love for you, Father. And Lord, just uh, the, the complex issues and the... the um, Yes, the wording, the getting things straight. But Father, just thanking you for the simplicity as well, mm -hmm. that either we're in Christ or not in Christ. And I thank you, especially when Ivan was talking about when we're reading the scriptures. And uh, Lord, we're not looking for doctrines. We're not looking for, Father, to worship you know, uh, teachings and doctrines. We're looking to worship you when we read your word. We pray that you would illumine our hearts, Father that we will follow and be obedient to your word, Lord. We pray that we, you would use this entire series to build up the body of Christ, yes, and that, Father, we would be, Lord, uh, your ambassadors going forth into this world, Father, with the truth. And, Father, with the, just the equipping that we need to answer the questions that the world has, yes, with gentleness and reverence, but also, Father, with the offensive word of God, Father. We thank you so much, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brothers.